We'll be beginning in a moment once everyone is in from the waiting room. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us and welcome to tonight's program. Before we begin, a reminder that this program will be recorded and uploaded to YouTube. Please direct any questions that you have at any point during the evening uh, through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. The Jewish Heritage Center of Western Canada is located on ancestral lands on Treaty 1 territory and the Red River Valley is also the birthplace of the Métis. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. May we live with respect on this land and live in peace and friendship with its peoples. The mandate of the Jewish Heritage Centre is to develop, interpret, and disseminate information on the history and culture of Western Canadian Jewry, and to develop an awareness of the history, moral and ethical implications of the Holocaust and other human rights violations. As one of our generous supporters so aptly put it, in order to look to the future, you have to preserve the past. Tonight, on the eve of Kristallnacht, we mark the third event of the Jewish Heritage Center for Holocaust Education Week. We thank the Jewish Federation of Winnipeg for its partnership and ongoing support, as well as the Azrieli Foundation, the Jewish Foundation of Manitoba, and the Asper Foundation, all of whom help to ensure that Holocaust education reaches thousands of students and adults each year with our programming. Teaching about the Holocaust requires sensitivity, knowledge, and training. Best practices in teaching this subject have evolved greatly in the last decade. The International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, or IRA, has published guidelines for teaching and learning that focus not only on the how, but also the why. The Jewish Heritage Center is proud to provide professional development opportunities to Manitoba educators in partnership with Manitoba Education and Training, Yad Vashem, the Azrieli Foundation, and others. And we are pleased tonight to bring you one of Manitoba's star Holocaust educators. Kelly Hebert has been teaching at Westwood Collegiate for 15 years. His core subjects include American and Canadian history, Western civilization, and international baccalaureate history with a concentration on the Americas, looking at the rise of authoritarian states, the move to global war, and Cold War politics. He has been studying the Holocaust for over 20 years with a focus on best pedagogical practices in secondary schools. Kelly majored in history at the University of Winnipeg, taking courses in Slavic studies, Soviet intellectual history, Eastern European history, and the Holocaust. Kelly has taken part in many renowned professional development sessions on teaching and learning about the Holocaust, including Yad Vashem, Tel Aviv University, Echoes and Reflections, and local initiatives such as the Jewish Heritage Center's Holocaust and Human Rights Symposium. He is currently working on his master's in education from the University of Manitoba in teaching, learning, and curriculum studies with a focus on Holocaust education. And as part of his studies, Kelly created the Westwood Historical Society that gives students agency and voice in social justice issues in which they want to become active participants. This has included the documentary, Truth Against Distortion, Survivors Speak Out Against Hate, that focuses on the rise of hate and anti-Semitism in Canada. This project has led him to become a finalist for the Governor General's Award for Teaching Excellence in History. And as well, he will be taking part in another Holocaust Sites Tour with Professor Jody Perun in July of 2022. Kelly. 
<clears throat> thank you so much for that uh, fine introduction, Bell. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I just want to thank everybody in the audience for tuning in. I'm always uh, appreciative of people's time. It's the one thing that is most valuable uh, in my point of view, and the fact that you are here with us today is uh, it's an honor and a privilege for me to, to be here and to speak to you. And hopefully, um, you know, get you guys thinking a little bit about uh, theoretical frameworks, uh, within um, Holocaust education and uh, the pedagogical practices that uh, I implement with my students uh, as well. Uh, okay, I'm gonna try to share my screen or, Bell, are you sharing my screen? I'll the share. PowerPoint? Okay, perfect. And so I will uh, be going over quite uh, a few concepts and I will be more than happy to answer any questions uh, or comments that uh, anybody has afterwards. And so I just want to make sure that I stick to the script here. Uh, as many people know from me, uh, I like to speak and I can probably talk for hours. So I know we only have about 45 minutes, if not less than that, for me to speak. And so I want to make sure that I uh, do justice to that and to the audience. So, um, yes, so I'll be speaking to you uh, about getting into a dialogue uh, with students uh, about the Holocaust. And here we just have a photo of some of my uh, students, some have graduated already, and some are in grade 12 this year, and uh, they have spent the last two years with myself uh, making a documentary about the rise of hate and anti-Semitism in Canada, which we will show you a trailer for at the end of the presentation. Uh, so if I can get to the next slide. I know I put fancy transitions in here, that's always a mistake. <laughs> I deal with high school students, I got to keep their attention. So just bear with me. Uh, so here's just a background as to what I'm going to be speaking to today. Uh, it, it, it's such a complex topic once we get into uh, teaching and learning about the Holocaust. So I want to try to keep it uh, to some main points of focus. So I will give a very brief background. I think Bell did a, a marvelous job introducing me, so I don't think I need to spend too much time on that. Uh, but I'll get into the theoretical framework and pedagogy that I uh, implement into my teaching practices, um, the rationale uh, for teaching and learning about the Holocaust that I use uh, from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and IRA as well, guidelines for teaching about the Holocaust, just to give some people an idea as to what they should keep in mind uh, if they do uh, choose to uh, teach about this uh, very important topic, uh, current statistics on students' knowledge of the Holocaust, which focuses on a study uh, that was completed by uh, the show and consultation uh, organization in 2018, just showing some statistics as to why uh, Holocaust education uh, is more important than ever uh, in regards to what students know or think they know uh, about the Holocaust. And then I will be ending with uh, some of the opportunities that uh, I've uh, developed for my students to begin their own dialogue uh, in regards to uh, their own journey uh, in learning more about the Holocaust. So I'll speak to the documentary a little bit and just some of the other things that, that I do. Um, okay, next slide. So yeah, I'm not gonna speak too much to this. Like I said, Bell did a great job of this. Um, I just want to point out, uh, this is a photograph from the uh, interview that we did with Barbara Gozer uh, for our documentary and just the ability to have students there uh, during this time, uh, to interview survivors and to give them an intimate relationship in regards to asking them questions, working with me on developing questions and hearing their stories firsthand. You know, we don't have uh, that many uh, survivors uh, with us anymore. And uh, we do have a select few and they become a part of my family. And I know that the students have changed drastically uh, by having the opportunity to meet them and to speak with them. And uh, I know we have some survivors with us tonight. So I just want to thank you for tuning in. And um, yeah, hopefully you enjoy it. Uh, next slide. Okay, so getting into kind of the, the nitty gritty of uh, what I do as a, as a high school history teacher um, in regards to how I teach history, I approach it very much the same way with uh, any topic that I look at. And so I approach it from more of a critical theorist perspective uh, which was developed by Paulo Freire, who was a Brazilian uh, educational theorist that focused on critical theory, which is looking at um, issues uh, and developing the mindset of students in a critical and meaningful way. 
and walking with students, not above students and sharing knowledge with them and learning from them and uh, alongside them. And so that's a really important uh, concept for me that I implement on a regular basis, uh, rather than the more authoritarian top down process. I think it's so important that uh, we open a dialogue with students that they can share their thoughts and their ideas uh, to create their own understandings and also to add to, to mine as well, which lends itself to the dialogical methods um, where we get into dialogue and we learn through uh, discussion, we learn through talking, Socratic questioning, um, you know, giving voice and agency uh, to students to really dig in, in deep to sensitive topics. So this is the theoretical framework in which I, I position myself uh, regularly with the topics that I study. Um, in particular, the Holocaust itself. Uh, next slide. Uh, one of my uh, biggest influences in regards to how I teach and how I view students and the relationship that students play in learning uh, is from Janusz Korczak uh, or Henrik uh, Goldschmidt. Uh, that was his real name. His pseudonym was Janusz Korczak. Um, he's one of my idols. Uh, he, for many reasons, I could probably do another lecture on him. Uh, but I won't. Um, I love this quote that he stated that children are not the people of tomorrow, but the people of today. They are entitled to be taken seriously. They have the rights to be treated uh, the same as adults with tenderness and respect and as equals. And they should be allowed to grow into whoever they were meant to be. The unknown person inside each of them is the hope for the future. And I really adopt this uh, philosophy into my daily teaching. And I really think it's so important that when we do address um, sensitive uh, and complex and sometimes controversial issues, we need to have the students at the center of the learning, um, which is something that, again, is really important for me uh, when I dive into this topic. So I wanted to make sure that I gave credit to Yanis Korczak, um, who uh, ran an orphanage in Warsaw uh, for, for Jewish children and uh, went with them to Treblinka in uh, August of 1942 and kept their spirits high and went with them to uh, their ultimate demise. And I have the most admiration for him. And most people don't even know who he is in regards to educational pedagogy. So I wanted to make sure I included him in here. Uh, next slide. Okay, so there are many different rationales for teaching about the Holocaust. These are three key ones that I found uh, that are important to me. And uh, I've, I've, I have borrowed them from the Holo uh, United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. As teachers, that's what we do. We steal a lot of ideas and uh, we take what works for us and implement it into our daily teaching. So a big part of this is to get students to reflect on the roles and responsibilities that in uh, individuals and nations played. Uh, in the Holocaust, confronting the abuse of power, um, civil and human rights violations, genocidal acts. You know, we, we look more uh, at uh, the victims, trying to give the victims a voice that is often ignored because so much focus is, is placed on the perpetrators or collaborators that a lot of the time the victims end up uh, being ignored, which I think is, is shameful and it's a disservice to um, teaching about the Holocaust. And I think that's so important that we, we include that. Uh, the second thing is to provide context for students uh, to explore the fears, pressures, and motivations that influence the decisions of behaviors of individuals during the Holocaust. Uh, it, it's such a complex topic, and I, I don't consider myself a, an expert by any stretch, um, but it's so important that we approach it, we confront these uh, events, and we connect it to feelings and emotions that students can feel, uh, not to compare the, the Holocaust to, you know, what students go through today, because that would, that would be uh, er erroneous, to say the least, but to understand the fears that people had, that, that, that kids had um, of the students' age that I teach, the pressures that they felt uh, in regards to the, the events that they lived through, and then the motivations, like what motivated um, ordinary people, ordinary citizens to, you know, take part in these pogroms, German citizens to, that took part in hiding uh, uh, some of the Jewish families that lived in the same buildings. Like we need to look at multiple perspectives to really give uh, the context to what was really happening 
not just to look at it from one lens, but from, from many. And one thing that I really want to, to point out here is that the Holocaust uh, was not inevitable. It was preventable. And we have to understand that governments made choices and that uh, not only uh, legalized discrimination, but also allowed prejudice, hatred, and ultimately mass murder to occur. Uh, I think this is a, a very important point to hit home, that it was preventable. And it's really sad when we look at Canada's role uh, in, in neglecting uh, the Jewish uh, uh, suffering, the United States, and pretty much any other country besides the Philippines, Hong, uh, China, and a very small uh, set of other countries. Uh, and so we need to understand that a lot of countries played a role in this, whether or not they understand that or accept that, that's a whole other uh, challenge. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so when we when I teach about the Holocaust, you know, uh, the language that I use is extremely important, uh, staying away from stereotypes, staying away from uh, colloquialisms or, or anything that could sway students to have a misunderstanding um, of what we're talking about. So the language that I use is very clear. It's very intentional. And I make sure that that's clear to the students when we study it. Uh, the second is the balance of perspectives. I really focus on uh, Dr. Gregory Stanton's 10 stages of genocide as my, uh, as my framework for looking at the different perspectives. And, you know, uh, specifically when we're talking about Kristallnacht, you know, we're not just looking at uh, the Nazis, we're looking at, you know, ordinary citizens, we're looking at the Jewish families, uh, we're looking at uh, journalists um, and others that, that played a role at this time in reporting it, in reacting to it, uh, et cetera, to try to give students a full, um, as, as best perspective and understanding of the situation as, as we can. Um, definitely avoiding uh, generalizations and trivializing events, which can lead to, and does lead to, uh, more distortion today. That's on the rise more than ever, um, especially with social media and the, the way that students get their information. They just tend to, to go to uh, one of the leading um, social media networks, and they, that's what they take as truth. So we really have to break down and disseminate those events. Uh, the next one is contextualizing history. This is something I find a lot of people end up skipping. They go into the rise of the Nazis. They study World War II. They look at the extermination camps and the ghettos. Uh, they look at life afterward, maybe, when they come to Canada. But they often skip what Jewish life was like before. And I think that's shameful. I think that's, uh, again, very erroneous because to get an understanding of what was lost and how impactful it was, uh, you know, we do really have to have a, a, at least a bit of an understanding of what Jewish life was like before uh, the Holocaust in Western and in Eastern Europe, because that differed drastically as well. And again, giving a voice to the victims. I try to connect my students uh, with their ages to the people that were impacted by the Holocaust. I try to use other sources other than uh, Anne Frank's diary, although that is a great uh, resource. Um, she experienced it very differently from others that were living in Poland uh, or in Romania, Hungary, or other parts um, of Eastern Europe. So I try to try to give students, you know, various perspectives from females, males, um, students of, of different ages so that they can connect and relate to uh, some of the daily uh, experiences that were happening at the time. And then the last part is as teachers, we really need to think critically about what themes do we want to address. Uh, a big problem that I find talking with my colleagues and with other teachers is that they just find the topic too daunting. It's too large. It's too complex. And so they, they tend to avoid it, which I think is worse than, than trying to learn more about it and address it in a way uh, where you can be successful and effective. So you really need to think of the themes that you want to look at. Uh, that could be anything from Jewish life before, uh, you know, culture, uh, looking at religion, just beliefs and how, how did that play a role, looking at resist, I mean, if you think carefully about what do you really want to focus on. Here, I actually use this for one of my university courses as 
This was published in 2018, and there are more articles, sorry, monthly uh, regarding the need for Holocaust education. And so some of the statistics I put in here is just to show you uh, what some of the students, uh, what their knowledge of the Holocaust is in regards to millennials and Generation Z students. I'm, I'm not talking about uh, adults here. There was a study done with that. And the United States did uh, what was called the 50 state study. So you can literally go on and look at every state in the United States and how well they're doing uh, regarding Holocaust education. But I want to keep it uh, uh, to Canadian content uh, here. So 63% of those surveys did not know that 6 million Jews were murdered. They thought that it was under 2 million. Um, they, they didn't realize how many camps existed in the variety of camps and they couldn't name a single one. Some of them were able to name, you know, Auschwitz, which a lot of people have heard of, but there were over 40,000. Historians say anywhere between 42 and 44,000 camps uh, existed uh, during World War II. And um, the average ages that they're looking at is ages 18 to 39. Uh, I put the link down below. If people are interested, they can go and, and look at all the data that was discovered and, and collected. Uh, but I wanted to give just an idea that there is a concern here that this is the stats are going up. The percentages are going up, but not in a good way. It's not that students are learning more and understanding. It's they're learning less and understanding um, uh, even some of the basic facts. Um, so I wanted to include that for you as well. Uh, next uh, slide. So this was part of the study as well. I just I selected a couple charts to show you or to share with you. Um, this is chart five familiarity with key Holocaust figures showing the percentage of all Canadians and millennials and Generation Z uh, students. So again, age 18 to 35 uh, roughly. And it shows you in, in blue the percentage of all Canadians and what their knowledge is as well as the red uh, coloring with millennials and Generation Z. And I just want to show kind of the relationship. Oh, if we could go back just real quick. Uh, I mean, we see key figures like Adolf Hitler and Frank, uh, Oscar Schindler. I mean, most people have maybe heard the name, but they don't know too much about him. But I think the, the, the sad part for me is when we get to the last person, uh, Ali Wiesel, uh, who is a very well-renowned, well, well-renowned to those who study the Holocaust. Uh, Holocaust survivor who wrote the, uh, his biography uh, or autobiography, Night. Uh, many people have never even heard of him. And so this is, again, showing the importance of putting emphasis on the victims and not just looking at uh, the Nazis and Adolf Hitler. Sorry, Bell. Thank you. Uh, next slide. Uh, here's another table showing Holocaust education perceptions uh, during the data that was collected. So showing the percentage of all Canadian adults and millennials and Generation Zs. Uh, in regards to the statements, all students should learn about the Holocaust while at school. Adults say 82% and millennials also recorded at 82%. And then the second box, it is important to keep teaching about the Holocaust so it does not happen again. And in my uh, relationship with some of my colleagues and, and university colleagues, a lot of people, I, I've had a lot of conversations and they say, why, why is the Holocaust so important? Why not you know, this topic or why not that topic? You know, they, 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 I think they think that people have learned about it properly uh, and have dealt with some of these issues in, in a very um, uh, effective and efficient way. But the, the facts tell us, the data tells us that it's, they haven't and that the percentages are actually going in the other direction. Um, the further we move away from World War II and the Holocaust, you know, the more people lose the importance of what happened and they start to... Uh, feel that it's not as important, which is very concerning to me as a, not only as a history teacher, but uh, as a human being and teaching about humanity. Uh, next slide. Okay, so past pedagog uh, pedagogical practices uh, about teaching the Holocaust, and I've, I've mentioned some of these, I've made reference to some. Uh, there's always been a large focus on, you know, Adolf Hitler, who was he, his psychology, you know, why, where did his anti-Semitism come from? How did it develop uh, to the rise of the Nazis themselves? You know, was this Hitler's war? You know, who, who else should be held responsible? Um, looking at various people like Hermann Goring, Joseph Goebbels, uh, Reinhard Heydrich, um, Heinrich Himmler. And I mean, the list goes on and on. Um, that has changed a little bit, but there's still a large focus on that. Um, another one is looking at the historical arguments of Hitler's role in the Holocaust. 
Um, in the past, you know, historians tended to focus on, you know, the smoking gun as, well, where's the order? Where did the order that Hitler gave for this? And people don't realize that, you know, after the T4 program from 39 to 40, there was no order signed by Hitler ever again because he saw how it backfired amongst the German population. And so he never signed another document in regards to this. And the bureaucracy of the Nazis kind of took over as well. Um, so there's it, there's so many moving parts to 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 deconstruct here that people need to be aware of. Um, the third one is the Holocaust tended to be more of a a background event or a watershed event um, rather than the main focal point of World War II. And this is something that I've wrestled with throughout my learning and through courses that I've had uh, with uh, professors at the University of Winnipeg. Where now my focus is on this was more about the war against the Jews. Uh, this was a racial war, a war of annihilation, and that the Holocaust is centered to it, and it has to be centered to it when we teach about it. And so that's a different thought process as well. Uh, the fourth one is uh, focusing on the atrocities that took place, so extermination camps, and usually with a heavy focus on Auschwitz. Uh, they, they, a lot of people tend to, to forget that you know Auschwitz came later uh, in the process of industrial murder, and a lot of people have no idea about Belchek, Sobibor, uh, Kelmno, Mindanik, uh, Treblinka. Some people have never even heard of these. And they just know uh, Auschwitz and maybe Dachau. And those are two very different camps in itself. So this just, just shows us that we need to be trained. Uh, there needs to be emphasis on teaching this and getting it right. Um, the fifth one, uh, only recently has there been a movement to focus more on the victims and resistance and specifically fo uh, focusing on uh, the Jewish perspective, Romas uh, in particular as well, um, Slavs and others that were targeted, Jehovah's Witness, Freemasons, uh, and their collaborators. So this is something that's becoming more uh, prominent, especially in my teaching, and this is what I recommend to others as well, that they really need to, to uh, focus on the victims. Because again, uh, a lot of the times it's, it's the Nazis, it's the, it's the bureaucratic machine, um, you know, it's the, it's the killing, the brutality, but then we forget about the people that this actually happened to. And that really angers me when I, when I hear about this, cause that's, that's a disservice to, to the, to the people that, uh, were, were killed. Uh, the last one is there's a rise in revisionism, uh, to distort the Holocaust. And by this, what I mean is you have countries like Poland, Hungary, Croatia that are continuously rewriting their history that are saying specifically for Poland that they suffered just as much, if not more uh, than the Jewish people. Uh, and therefore they, they don't even acknowledge the suffering uh, of the Jewish people to an extent. And I'm talking about the government in particular. Um, and, and this is an issue. This is something that is very concerning. Um, Jan Grabowski, uh, who's a professor at the University of Ottawa, who has written substantially on the roles of uh, some of the Polish collaborators, um, but, the, you know, and he also talks about the, the, the polls that helped. And it's, it's not a matter of, of pointing fingers. It's, it's about reporting the truth. And I think that's something that is extremely important when we teach about the Holocaust, is we make sure that we tell the truth. Uh, next slide. Okay, so uh, again, I'm not going to, you know, go over this too much. Uh, I think Friedlander, uh, who is an educational uh, specialist from 1979, not to... Uh, to, to confuse with Saul Friedlander, who is a Holocaust scholar uh, as well. But something that he said was that the problem with too much being taught by too many without focus is that this poses the danger of destroying the subject matter through dilettantism or by romanticizing or, um, you know, avoiding the facts, you know, taking away from it by trying to generalize it uh, to give people an understanding. Uh, it is not enough for well-meaning teachers to feel a commitment to teach about genocide. They must also know the subject. And I think that's really important. And this is why training professional development uh, is so essential to this. And this is a part of what I want to do after my master's as well as to help train teachers and work in association with uh, the Jewish Heritage Center uh, of Western Canada and other organizations to help uh, perpetuate this training. And we must confront uh, the issues of the Holocaust. Um, we don't just teach it, we confront it. And we confront it together as teachers and students alike. Um, it is emotional. I mean, 
if you don't get emotional when you learn about it, um, that's kind of distressing to me. And every year that I teach about it, I, I'm the first one to show emotion. Um, I'm the first one to be vulnerable and express how, how this makes me feel as a teacher, as a father, as a brother. Um, you know, it, you got to relate and you got to connect to it and try to make that uh, relevant to your life. Um, so first, uh, when we look at research showing that many educators who consider teaching uh, the Holocaust feel deterred. heard from doing so. These are the, these are the, we're talking again with colleagues needed to develop it. Um, oh, my connection again, sorry, apologize. Uh, uh, they feel like they don't have the subject matter knowledge. It is overwhelming historically and pedagogically because the Holocaust is, quote, is a thorny subject. Teaching it can be like trying to find one's way through a minefield. And the last one, and perhaps most important, is that they worry about whether or not they can pre present such an emotionally charged subject in a way that does justice to the topic while observing the sensitivities that must be considered in planning a course of study for different age groups of, of learning. Uh, and I'll touch upon this in the next slide, I believe. Okay, yeah, so the first, the first thing, this is how I do it. This is kind of my checklist uh, that I make sure that I have ready to go before I even think about uh, presenting any information or context. Uh, I need to make sure that there's a safe environment where students have agency, they feel safe, uh, they feel that it's okay to show emotion, it's okay to be angry, it's okay to be sad. Um, I don't know why I'm getting emotional. <laughs> um, but they need to feel that they have uh, a right to, to, to be expressing themselves and that it's okay to have those emotions when learning about uh, this topic. I think that's that's normal. That's natural. Uh, we need to know what our students' needs are. We need to know how they learn emotionally, cognitively, physically, spiritually. Um, if you don't know your students, then you can't, I don't know how you can teach them anything. But when we approach a topic like the Holocaust, we really need to know our students. We need to know where they're at. We need to know if there's any possible triggers that could impact them. And this is something that, that I take uh, personally uh, every year that I touch upon this, I try to make sure that I have a good understanding of my students uh, and I develop my units around them. Um, that we have a dialogue, it's ongoing, it's active. It's okay to show emotion. It's okay to be vulnerable. Um, again, I've, I've cried in front of my students. Um, I'm just an emotional guy. I just, I can't hold it in. I can't hide it. Um, and I, I think that's important for them to see uh, the teacher being able to be open and not, you know, re you know, reserved or, or guarding their emotions because then they might not genuinely interact and connect with these topics. Uh, obviously, including access to primary documents. I try to use uh, as many local survivor stories as possible to let them know that Winnipeg has a large or we still have uh, survivors living in Winnipeg. They have a story that needs to be heard and told. Um, you know, it's not just about uh, the brutality, although that is important for students to learn about, but it's also important to learn how these how these people live day to day and the struggles that they went with, uh, went through on a regular basis um, so that they can build that, that personal connection to the person that they're learning about. And so those are just uh, some examples of primary documents. And then the last one is obviously with, with COVID, it's hard to connect students with, with local Holocaust survivors, but you can do it through Zoom or you can watch uh, testimony that's there's plenty a plethora of, of testimony out there um, and for me I've just been very blessed to be able to have my students be able to interact and interview Holocaust survivors themselves and I think they've changed as people in a positive way uh, next slide uh, I, I give as many opportunities for my students to to go and hear from others others that are specialists in this field not just from me but to hear multiple perspectives. I think it's so important to give voice uh, to those that were marginalized during this time, to hear from the Jewish community and their thoughts and their feelings uh, regarding these issues. I think that's uh, something that's really needed in many topics uh, of study. And so here's just one example 
uh, learning about anti-Semitism today uh, through political cartoons in Canada and the United States, um, giving them an, uh, um, a hands-on experience where they can ask specialists about these issues as well. Uh, next uh, slide. Uh, again, students hearing from survivors. Uh, I Again, I can't express how privileged I feel today um, to know the survivors that we interviewed. I feel like they're my family and I'm their family. Um, I, I continue to visit with them uh, as much as I can. Uh, Frank, as you can see on the, I guess it'd be my right. Um, I just had coffee with him the other day and he's, he's kind of like a grandfather to me. Uh, my grandparents are gone, but he, he's kind of like an adopted grandfather for me. And then on the left, we have Angie, who uh, is from Montreal. And all of the survivors that we interviewed uh, have a big place in my heart. And I make sure to keep in contact with them. And same with the students. The students are always asking, how are they doing? And want updates. And, and they want to hear about how the students are doing. So it's, it's really interesting to see the relationship that has built... Uh, amongst my students and the, the survivors themselves, which I think is quite unique. Uh, next slide. Uh, so I'll, I'll just touch upon this briefly because I know time is uh, running low here. So I, I came across three things and this is uh, found um, uh, in the IRA uh, handbook for uh, and research about teaching about the Holocaust and three things to avoid. And I've kind of touched upon this before, but I think number one is really important that I, I, I touch upon this is be responsive to the appropriateness of written and visual content and do not use horrific imagery to engage your students in a study of the Holocaust. Research has shown that this can actually turn students off from wanting to learn more about it. And in my opinion, it, it, it dehumanizes and victimizes those that were were killed and it takes away that humanity and so i do my best never to use any of those horrific images i try to show images of them before um, before the holocaust and memoirs and other journal entries um, as the process kind of evolved uh, but i really do encourage people to stay away from uh, the grotesque uh, photos that are out there especially when you're dealing with high school students depending on the age level you really have to be aware of, of what they're able to handle. Um, I, I think that's, that's a number one priority before even teaching the subject to students. Avoid comparisons. You know, we're seeing this on a regular basis on social media in regards to the, the vaccines and the Star of David and comparing ghettos to restrictions. And, and I, I just find that just a lot of people don't realize that this uh, can, do some, can do some serious harm in how we how we look at the Holocaust and how it becomes distorted um, and, and people look at it in a way that, uh, you know, takes away from the significance of what did take place. Uh, okay. I, uh, yeah. Avoid simulations. Uh, I've heard of, I've heard of teachers using simulations. For instance, there's one teacher in the United States who thought it was a good idea to put his high school English students on the, the same diet that Jewish uh, prisoners were on in Auschwitz. Uh, this is true. This has been done. Um, he got uh, reprimanded quite substantially for this. And the students were given, I think, 180 calories a day. How he was able to do this without being grilled or taken into the administration's office, I have no idea. Um, but we always, I always encourage, do not do any simulations at all uh, in regards to that. It's just a topic you can't do that with. Uh, next slide. Uh, okay, so now we're getting into some of the things that I do with my students. Something that's really important to me is active participation in creating authentic student learning. Uh, again, the documentary, I'll let the trailer speak for itself. Um, I am so proud of these guys and, and the ladies that took part in, in this documentary. We're still working on it. It should be done hopefully by the end of November, early December. But we spent over two years working on this during COVID, all the restrictions we negotiated, we navigated. Um, all of the interviews that we did, we did following restrictions uh, and the guidelines and just the dedication, the commitment and the passion, sorry, <laughs> that my students have for this topic is inspirational to me. And although I think I inspire them, they inspire me just as much, if not more. And if, if people think that students are not capable of great things, then they don't know how to teach.
and they can email me if they have problems with that comment. But um, so I want to give students a, a choice to investigate themes and to really dig into these topics are, that are interest of interest to them. Uh, next slide. Okay, and here we go. This is the last slide uh, before we get to the trailer. Oh, there we go. Um, so this whole project was to to empower students and student voice. That's really what this documentary is about. I, I'm just kind of the vessel that happens to be moving pieces around. Um, but I give all the credit to the students, um, to Nathan Varghese, who's coming up uh, uh, with the uh, Mina Rosner Award. Uh, his dedication to this project, as well as all the other students, is incredible. And um, I'm just so proud of them. So without further ado, I think uh, the trailer will speak for, for the students and for what we're doing. And let's hope that the link is going to work. Is the link uh, opening up, Bell? Are you not hearing it? No, I don't hear or see anything. Is it playing? Um, it was. Um, I clicked on the link. Um, I just I'm see not... the power. Yeah, okay. I don't. I just see the PowerPoint and myself. Okay, I will try it again. Um, that's not, okay, just a sec. Um, At the time. Um, and uh, after the Nazis occupied that part of Poland in 1941, they went on a systematic extermination campaign of all the Jews in Buchach and that region. And she was the only survivor amongst all her family members, her parents, her brothers and sisters, her aunts and uncles and grandparents and so forth. <clears throat> Buchach had about 15,000 people before the war, about half of them were, were Jews. And um, I, I have a picture here of Buchach. After the war, there were a, approximately a hundred Jewish survivors. And my mother was lucky enough to be one of them. Um, she was separated from my father, who was also really one of the only survivors of his family in the Holocaust. And they reunited after the war and they moved to Canada in, in 1948. Um, the child she was pregnant with um, was born and lived till age three and died during during the war uh, and then then there were two more children born my brother and myself um, and as bill mentioned um, my mother did uh, spend a lot of time and effort to try to educate people about what happened during the holocaust um, she spoke to lots of kids and, and students and wrote articles and amassed a lot of uh, information and literature about it and um, and wrote a book. And, um, and so when she died in 1997, uh, there was a lot of generous donations to a fund that we set up. Uh, and the fund goes to um, uh, sponsoring this annual um, prize. Uh, and, and my mother, of course, uh, was a survivor of the Holocaust, very knowledgeable, of course, about what took place during the Holocaust, not just her own family story. But um, we deliberately called the, the prize the Human Rights Prize because my mother believed that um, it's, not the, it's not just Jews that have to, um, or, or Jewish um, 
issues that have to be highlighted, but human rights for all people um, across the world. And so this, this essay prize in which um, high school students are allow, are enter every year uh, can focus on the Holocaust or they can focus on other human rights issues. Just want to tell a, a really brief story um, about uh, my mother and I in 1990 uh, went back to her hometown. It was the first time she had visited her hometown since uh, leaving in 1948. Um, and uh, we, we, we toured uh, a, a few different places. Kelly talked about visiting uh, some of the uh, actual locations. I think that's a very important thing for students and other people to try to do. We did that as well. Uh, we, we visited Majdanek. We also visited Belgets, which not a lot of people know about. Um, it's, it was an extermination camp in which between five and 600,000 Jews were exterminated in, including my aunt, my mother's sister. And just to give you an example of the revisionism or um, deliberate disinformation and misinformation that is perpetuated on some of these things. Um, when we got to Belgium, we got into a cab. We had a film crew with us and we created a documentary about this trip. We got into a camp and we said to the cab driver, take us please to the site of the extermination center. And he didn't know where it was. So the taxi driver in the tiny little village of Belgium in Poland had no idea where the site was of a place where half a million people were exterminated. So think about that for a second. How is that even possible? But here's, here's something to think about. If someone came to visit you from another country and said, hey, can you take me to the site of where there are some unmarked graves of residential school survivors? Would you know where to go? I'm not sure I would. Um, so this kind of revisionism and disinformation happens a lot in this world. Um, and it's great that we have people like Kelly who are devoted to educating young people about the horrors that have taken place in the past and are still taking place in many respects. Um, so this year, the, uh, there were a number of entries in the, and the jury that decided that uh, Nathan's uh, essay um, was the clear winner. Um, I think Nathan did a tremendous job on this topic. It's, it's a very comprehensive, perceptive, essay. What I really liked about it, I liked a lot of things about it, but what I really liked about it is that uh, it's a very modern uh, kind of analysis. He talks about social media, how social media is now being used to um, perpetuate hate um, in all kinds of respects. He also uh, he talks quite a bit about the Holocaust itself, um, but he, but he's careful to mention other um, genocides that have taken place historically around the world. So I think it, it's both important that it looks at the Holocaust, and it also looks at other atrocities and human rights violations that have happened at different periods of time. And it's very forward looking in that it's looking at how social media is now actually a very dangerous tool in the hands of the wrong people. So I wanna congratulate Nathan um, on winning the um, Mina Rosner essay prize this year. And um, I hope you go on to um, great things in your future education and continue um, telling this story and educating people about these topics. Thank you, Nathan. Congratulations. Thank you. And I'm especially thankful to all the support I received, especially from Mr. Hebert and cultivating this interest in history and this passion for it. 
I'd, I'd like to add that we were very fortunate to have Nathan as our intern at the Jewish Heritage Center this year. It's unfortunate that because of COVID, it was kind of a virtual internship. And I know that in the summer you worked at Oseradoc as well in their archive. And um, I, you know, join in, in what Cecil has said. I, I think that your essay was really a cut above. Um, and I'm sure that to my mind, any second year university professor would have been quite pleased to have an essay of this caliber. And so I, I know that you will do very, very well. Um, so thank you. And thank you to the other students as well who submitted uh, their essays, which were also very good. And I want to thank you, Kelly, for that absolutely uh, wonderful presentation. You know, we're so inspired when we see teachers who are really passionate about this really important aspect of history. And um, just to note, uh, we apologize again that uh, we had the technical difficulty, but Kelly has, if you click on the chat button, you'll see that Kelly has put the link in there um, so that you can watch the uh, um, trailer of the documentary. Uh, we look forward very much at some point in the future to host uh, the launch of the entire documentary. It has been so wonderful being involved in it and watching the students interviewing the survivors so sensitively and really hearing, you know, a, a contrast uh, in, in many ways be, uh, from earlier interviews, because of course we have the interviews from the 1980s for the Shoah Foundation. And um, then we did another series of interviews about 10 years ago in partnership with the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. And every time it, it seems that as our survivors get a little bit older, they add something to a, a different aspect of the story that perhaps they weren't able to talk about 10 years ago or 40 years ago. And this is so important that we have these testimonies, especially now. I know that, that we lost um, a couple of survivors uh, during this uh, period of COVID. We lost one survivor to COVID. And of course, we lost Henny, who you interviewed. Um, and um, it is so important that we have these testimonies. Today, as you mentioned, uh, Kelly, there, the issue of distortion is becoming more and more severe. And um, we're seeing expressions of anti-Semitism that 20 years ago, we would have not expected. Certainly, um, you know, and, uh, to, to this extent, so this work is so important. So um, I don't, I, oh, I see a question. Um, this is from Dan Stone. Thank you, Kelly, for your thoughtful analysis of teaching issues. I had the pleasure of meeting some of your students a few years ago and was very impressed by their skills and their involvement. Please take some of the credit for this, absolutely. And for now, I'll just ask you how you will adjust your teaching when the number of survivors declines even further. And I should, I should say that, um, I should add to what Dan has said that, you know, there are a few survivors who have really done so many presentations for us in the past that um, in the last, just before COVID started and since COVID have said, Belle, I can't do this anymore. As they get older, the emotional cost is just too great on them. And um, for many of them, just the experience of COVID and, and, and being alone um, has been very, very hard on them. So uh, local survivors who will speak in person, you know, we, we, have, on, we have only a, a couple. Um, so over to you, Kelly, um, how, how do you foresee the, the future? Thank you, Professor Stone. Uh, I can call him Daniel now. He was one of my professors and a mentor mm -hmm. to me. And I loved his courses and I wish he was still teaching, but that's okay. I still learn from him through conversation. Um, yeah, I guess a big part of how I will not change, but um, um, change my pedagogy when there's not as many survivors is definitely using the documentary, using parts of the film uh, where we did interview uh, various survivors and in different aspects of their life, 
that's going to be part of my toolkit forever um, and using other interviews that have been done in Winnipeg as well. Um, but always using their stories to to connect and, and trying to introduce uh, survivors from Winnipeg to students that have no idea that we had such a large uh, group of Holocaust survivors and they all have such a unique and important story. And so um, and, and just my conversations with them, I've learned so much from them from just talking with them. I will never forget our interactions with each other and I will bring that to my teaching as well. To be able to say, you know, at the coffee table when I was having coffee with Barbara and her daughter and uh, Sharon's husband, uh, you know, we talked about this. Or they mentioned that or having coffee at McDonald's with Frank and he brought up another story like those are, are things that will always be with me. And I will always include them in my teaching because it's part of that dialogical conversation. And to be a good history teacher, you have to be a good storyteller and get people into the story that you're telling and i use their stories i don't use my own and that their stories tell it and it's strong enough so i hope i answered that well um so taking that further um what do you what is your opinion on um using um the second generation to tell their parents stories i know that um there have been several times where i've done that where we haven't had a survivor and of course they're people out there, such as Sharon, who know her mom's story so well. Um, what do you think? Yeah, I think that's really important too. Um, and that's something that I would definitely include into my teaching as well. Uh, and I know, Belle, we've talked substantially about it and getting your parents' story that we had in our documentary as well. I think it's really important to, to incorporate uh, second generation um, survivors, uh, children of survivors, because they want to tell their parents' story, at least from the ones that I've talked with. And I think it, it's, it may not be the same, obviously, but I still think it's just as powerful and students can still connect because you're talking with a sibling, not a sibling, sorry, you're talking with a family member um, that knew their parents extremely well. And you can get a different perspective on their story, maybe even uh, a, a unique understanding that you wouldn't get from hearing it from the survivor themselves. So uh, I think that's really important that we, we start looking in that direction as well, uh, you know, the further we go uh, into in, our discussions. And I, th I think even the third generation, um, you know, my situation is different because my parents passed away many, many decades ago. Um, but I, I know that for many people, um, there was a sharing of the story with the grandchildren that didn't necessarily uh, take place with the children for whatever reason. Um, and uh, sometimes the third generation is, it can tell the story uh, e even more easily. They've had that very close relationship and, and know the story very well. And, and then of course we have, um, you know, the incredible, thank goodness, uh, collection of testimonies um, right here locally, the work that you did, and the more than 52,000 testimonies that appear on the, uh, on the Shoah Foundation Visual History Archive, which is now available. Um, I see that uh, Jody has, uh, no, uh, I think it's in the chat. Ah, Jody Perun has said, um, the second generation can tell their own stories this is very true, how they were affected by what happened to their parents. And that's a valuable part of history too. And yes, absolutely. And, and um, something that I, um, I certainly in include when I'm talking about, I, I think it's impossible not to include that. Um, Tony Tavares, uh, who is with Manitoba Education and Training and, and very often our partner in, in putting on professional development, says, years ago, I was shocked by the growth of neo-Nazis in Europe. Now we're experiencing the same trend in North America. How do we explain the continued interest of youth in these racist and debunked beliefs? Any, I'm opening this up to all of you. Uh, yeah, I'll speak to that because that's, uh, that's something that I, I do tackle in, in my classes as well to connect it to the present. Um, we have to understand that at least my understanding is that a lot of fanatic uh, fanatics or radicals uh, tend to 
you know, buy these untruths that are being sold from disinformation. They want this sense of belonging and they find it uh, in these radical groups. And they, they just, they don't know, they don't know the facts. They don't, they're, they're not educated in these topics. And a lot of it happens through the dark web. It happens, um, you know, outside of conversation. And this reminded me of a, I'll, this will be very quick, I promise, of a conversation I had with my father-in-law um, about having the ability to have free speech and to be able to talk about these issues publicly and openly so that they don't get swept under the rug and so that these groups don't get a, an outlet or an alley to start to form and kind of have these cell groups, if you would, to perpetuate these issues. Like we do need to talk about these in an open in an educational context um, to, to, to educate uh, the, a lot of these people on, on why this is not correct way of thinking, um, just based on factual information. That's, that's how I would address it. And could I add something to that? Um, I mean, we, we live in a world where uh, presidents and prime ministers and political parties in many countries are fueling this trend. Like, uh, in, many, in many countries throughout Europe, you have organized campaigns at the highest levels against immigrants, against um, people who are dispossessed. Um, and so, sure, there, there's, there's these radical fringe elements, but, you know, when you have a U.S. president, for instance, who's building a wall and banning banning immigration from Muslim countries. Um, this, is, this is giving encouragement to all of these types of trends, which is why it's so, it's so important for anyone interested in human rights or anyone interested in, truly interested in making sure that some of these events never happen again, to, uh, to speak up uh, at any abrogation of human rights, whether it's in your community or somebody else's community. You know, when um, my wife and I were in uh, Berlin a few years ago, we visited Sachsenhausen, um, which was one of the early camps that the Germans set up in 1938, 39. Um, and, uh, you know, first they took, uh, you know, the famous phrase by Martin Niemöller, first they came for the trade unionists and the communists and so forth. And that's exactly who they took to Sachsenhausen. Um, trade unionists, lab labor leaders, communists, so forth, and then Jews, and then you, you know the story. And by the way, Martin Niemöller was taken to Sachsenhausen himself. And so his message is, um, be vocal, speak up. Doesn't matter if this is coming from the highest level of government, you need to make your voice heard uh, and, and fight against these trends when you see them happening. I absolutely agree with you. Um, the nationalist uh, and extremist agendas that we are seeing in so many countries, I think has given in a way permission uh, to say things that people would not have said uh, even only several years ago. Um, people, I think a lot of people, I mean, we know that anti-Semitism is thousands of years old and um, that these hateful ideas exist in society, but for a very long time after World War II, it was not appropriate to say these things in public. And people like Trump and others, all of a sudden made it okay to say these things aloud and, and everyone jumped in. The internet certainly um, spreads this information, I think much faster than we could have ever imagined before we had the internet. But one um, positive note is that UNESCO has done a study and shown that Holocaust education, first of all, teaches critical thinking. And second of all, it um, provides um, people that, that students that have had a good basis in Holocaust education are more likely to be able to um, um, not, uh, you know, embrace the kind of hateful messages that they see online or elsewhere, and that they're available to analyze these conspiracy theories and realize that they're nothing but that. 
And so this is just one more reason why this education is so important. Yeah, and I'll just jump in on one quick thing here that uh, that Cecil brought up is something like it, it's it's about uh, giving agency, giving voice to students, and and telling them it's okay to speak up, and that they have to speak up for those that sometimes can't speak up uh, for themselves. And I think that's exactly what this documentary is about. I think this is what I do on a regular basis when we look at primary documents and we look at current events and and we look at how anti-Semitism is, is on the rise again and just different forms of hate as well, xenophobia, Islamophobia. Um, you know, we look at it as a human issue, right? This is humanity. And it comes back to the question I first asked myself is, you know, what kind of world do I want my kids growing up in? That's really what started this whole passion for me. What world do I want my two boys to grow up in? And it's not this kind of world. Well, thank you very much. This was a wonderful evening. Um, again, uh, Kelly has put the link to the documentary in the chat. And we have one more program tomorrow night, uh, Observance of, of Kristallnacht. And um, this will be uh, the last of several programs in Winnipeg's first time having Holocaust Education Week. So tomorrow night, we will be showing a film about an expedition to Vilna in which ground penetrating radar was used to look at the remains of the synagogue. And while they were doing that, they discovered the remains of um, a an escape tunnel that was dug by Jewish prisoners that over the years was often talked about, but there was no proof. And some people thought that it was just um, a myth. Uh, but in, in fact, they did discover this and we will be seeing the film and then that will be followed by uh, a talk by Paul Bauman, who is a geophysicist in Calgary who actually took part in the expedition. So if you haven't registered yet, please uh, do so. And just a reminder that all of the programs that we've done at the Jewish Heritage Center and recorded we then put up on our YouTube uh, channel. So if you know of someone who wants to see this program or the others, please let them know that they can look at that at any time. And again, thank you uh, to all of you and good night.